Okay, I can just advance this by using the arrows. Yes. Okay. Uh, the uh, the point I was going to make about education is that one can be a kind of master of uh, the 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 kind of uh, tectonics and pr procedures of construction, and without the support and knowledge of a client, it's all for naught. You will not get your project built. And the, the, uh, one of the interesting issues when we look at why buildings look the way they do, ostensibly this is going to be a talk on, on elevations, but uh, ultimately uh, it really becomes a talk about what architecture is and why, uh, but, uh, and uh, really has to be seen from uh, a, a historical uh, perspective. I had a, a, Enrique had promised me my notes on the, <laughs> okay. No, well, maybe not. But I was so impressed with the, with the, uh, the materials lectures and their reference to building, date, uh, architect in a very academic way. I wanted to. Can you, can you get the. Yeah, let me try that. <coughs> in any event, uh, in the end, is and has been and, and what it's going to be in the future. And that really has to do, I think, with, oh great, fantastic, that's perfect. Okay, let's look at the, this first slide. Uh, when I initially, uh, I was going through and I thought, well, I'll start out by showing some relatively recent buildings and discussing their elevational treatment. And uh, so I started out and I immediately kind of became overwhelmed with the issues that would have to be discussed. Uh, this is a building by Nicholas Grimshaw in, in Spain, La Cortuna, uh, and it's, uh, it's an office building and it exists between, uh, between for me, a kind of interesting uh, set of existing buildings that really encompass uh, a significant amount of time in the history of office buildings. Uh, uh, and what I uh, was hoping to do in the lecture today is maybe pick, pick up on points and issues that were covered in previous lectures and kind of try and relate them to a, uh, a, a discussion of, of elevational treatment and the kind of process of, of generating elevation. And one of the things that I confronted almost instantly was the, the change. And, uh, I don't know uh, uh, if you remember uh, the discussion about the kind of neoclassical building uh, where you had this kind of heavy mass of building. Uh, well, for much of architectural history, the uh, buildings have been predominantly structured and predominantly mass, mass, uh, and uh, according to uh, Gregory Turner in Construction Economics and Building Design, the uh, actually historically one could count on up to 80% of the building being related to the basic structure. So you had big, heavy, massive buildings, little punched holes, and uh, then there was a kind of transformation that occurred uh, that had to do with uh, both the uh, opportunities of technology and new materials. And the result of this was that at least in, and I'm not sure whether these exact percentages are, are correct, but there's this dramatic reduction in the building envelope 
which historically was building envelope structure, and a corresponding huge increase in the mechanical services, the uh, HVAC component of the building. Now, this is important for several reasons, one of which is that the, the building itself, the kind of building envelope, going back to our, our first example, becomes very, very light relative to the earlier mass of punch building like the building perhaps on the end of the street. Uh, uh, secondly, the, uh, the dominant uh, economic dri driving for the building is actually in mechanical activity, therefore in energy use. So uh, there's been a huge shift and buildings have become huge ener energy consuming objects and that has consequences for our environment, sustainability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so let's let's take a look at the examples we've had from our earlier distinguished faculty. Uh, so uh, Green and Green, Craftsman House, a kind of romantic referential uh, testimony to craftsmanship in the, of the old school. Uh, uh, one might argue uh, that there are questionable references to regional uh, concerns here, but overall, uh, the, if the, uh, the excessive use of, of wood is perhaps not regionally demonstrated by our uh, uh, directly adjacent forest, the, uh, the very gracious overhang balconies and relationship to the landscape certainly compensates for whatever other lack of questionable regional reference. In any event, uh, this has become a compelling uh, uh, and popular image for general society and to today there's a component of kind of craftsman wannabeism in, uh, in residential architecture that persists uh, to this day. Uh, at an, a, 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 and another extreme, this uh, Barker House, 1911, by Irving Gill, is just about as stripped a kind of vocabulary as you could possibly get. Gill was actually very interested in the technology of the building process. He, he did a lot of very innovative things with the use of, of concrete, tilt-up construction, and so on. And this kind of stripped lack of ornamentation was part of a very general move in architecture to, uh, to create a kind of new epoch, a new a new uh, attitude toward architecture as the as a representation of the opportunities of technology to to create an environment which was uh, which was an, a, a continuing improvement in status for uh, uh, the environment. Uh, you. You uh, are all familiar with the Lovell House. Uh, this called the Health House because I guess of all the different levels and having to run up and down. Uh, but Lovell was actually a, a, a health freak. He had weights and all kinds of things and uh, was very enthusiastic about exercise. But the, uh, there's a curious juxtaposition here between a kind of structural bravado in the frame, it's a, you can see the, the steel frame, and the abstraction of the exterior skin into stucco and glass, which was a characteristic, certainly, of the kind of heroic modernist movement uh, 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 representation 
of that period. Uh, this is the uh, case study eight house by Ray and Charles Ames, done in 1949, uh, moving uh, uh, very quickly uh, forward. Uh, but although there, I, I don't think anyone would quibble about this being a, a contemporary or modern modernist house, uh, the attitude is is quite different than the earlier level uh, house. And uh, the elements had to, uh, were taken off the shelf, uh, prefabricated elements off the shelf. It was assembled very quickly uh, 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 with uh, pre-cut, uh, 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 pre-drilled steel and uh, 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 prefabricated uh, doors, uh, windows, and panels. Uh, this, this house had a tremendous influence, architectural influence, and uh, has a kind of curious dichotomy because uh, it's referred to all the time, but many of the fundamental uh, philosophical commitments made by this house for prefabrication as a way of actually providing more economical, lower cost housing uh, have never really been realized. Uh, and like the earlier modernist uh, attitudes uh, of the international style as characterized by, by uh, Neutra, uh, there was a, a philosophical component to the design, which somehow, uh, uh, over time, transformed into a kind of marketing style that, that was associated with particular characteristics, but certainly not the underlying social, social issues that, to a certain extent, provoked the initial attempts. Uh, you're all familiar with uh, uh, early Frank Geary, this is the Ron Davis Studio, 1972, uh, which is uh, a kind of tweaked box with very simple punched uh, opening uh, gla glazing in a very, very uh, abstracted elevation, uh, very uh, uh, a, a simple material, materiality, and much of the design, again, uh, characteristically uh, uh, achieved through slight adjustments to the conventional form. So you have a conventional shed building, and if you're familiar with the plan, the plan just kind of tweaked the building out or cranked the wall slightly. This kind of tendency obviously became much more Exas uh, exasperated later, later on. The, uh, this, of course, is the Geary, uh, Geary residence, the, uh, the kind of residue of the existing house uh, behind, and, and here a technique of collage has kind of overlaid uh, uh, distinct uh, elements onto an existing conventional building and come up with a, a kind of dialectic between new material, new attitude, new form, and, and the kind of existing building, although in many respects the existing building has been completely dominated by the, by the new attitude. What's particularly interesting about the rear elevation is that there is a a kind of conventional set of openings which is then exposed in a ostensibly unfinished back. But what, what is actually happening here is that the exposed uh, shear wall plywood framing, uh, lintels for doors, and so on uh, starts to have a vocabulary a kind of post-craftsman 
a kind of anti-craftsman vocabulary, which, uh, which uh, allows for a kind of richness of interpretation. Uh, the, in the previous lecture, uh, uh, it was pointed out that there were some liabilities to this, especially since the conventional covering of joints and uh, uh, water, waterproofing have been kind of sacrificed to a kind of polemical uh, aesthetic. And so every few years, the building has to be completely redone because of the dry rot. However, it does certainly make a, a statement. In the end, however, in this building, the Schnabel House, uh, done for uh, actually a graduate of our school, architect Myrna Schnabel, uh, who uh, got a job in Frank's office, I think, on the condition that she commissioned a house. But uh, uh, in the end, the, the kind of, I think he even called it cheap, cheap escape architecture of the earlier uh, ideas uh, has become somehow uh, rarefied into very, very expensive materials, but the absolutely the same strategy for the design of the, uh, of the house. So it, there are a kind of collage of elements. There, the, the house is made up of fairly conventional forms, which then have been separated out in and articulated, so there's a kind of dialogue between different materials, different shapes, uh, different objects on the site, and it creates a relatively complex form. Uh, I can't remember the uh, architectural critic that pointed out that, that Frank Geary tends to organize every project as a village. As a, as a kind of microcosm of community. And this, uh, the articulation of elements and pieces is part of that strategy of uh, articulation and breakdown in hierarchy. Another example here, and this is a, a Morphosis house, Lawrence house, it was done in uh, 81 to 83, is a house which is, uh, for me, particularly interesting because as an elevational study, it's symmetrical and balanced in a very kind of classical compositional way, but the, uh, the elements, the uh, materials are, are tweaked enough to become uh, uh, somehow uh, contemporary. In the, in the rear of the same house, every element, including the, uh, lost my pointer, it's here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Uh, every element, including the uh, meter, has become recruited into a uh, incredibly uh, formal organization of elements and elevated to a, a kind of elegance that one would certainly not, not attribute to those, those particular things. So you've got vernacular lights, uh, uh, meter uh, vents, uh, electrical outlets in this kind of uh, uh, incredibly formal organization. Uh, here another, another project of that period during uh, 83 to 85. This was one of those kind of addition projects that Morphosis just worked and worked and worked on, uh, so much so that the office student recruitment spent hours on the site assembling each beautiful detail because to get any any actual uh, uh, contractor to do that would have been so prohibitive. But this brings up a, a general issue 
the relationship between the kind of idea about the project and the design and the kind of understanding of what is available as a resource to build. And in this case, none of these projects would have been realizable without a, 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 a kind of will and commitment to the necessary uh, involvement in the construction process to make these things happen. And uh, the results, all of the kind of complicated uh, detailing and controls of, of every element uh, were, were totally uh, uh, dependent on a, uh, an amazing amount of additional effort by the office to actually pull this off. Uh, incredibly exceptional. Okay, uh, if, we, if we're talking about basic construction, uh, as, as was pointed out in Gail's lecture, it's very hard to avoid discussing Khan. Uh, I, I, I found these, these drawings really beautiful because, uh, 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 and, and the pictures of the, of the finished building, because of the kind of uh, consummate care that Khan used in the developing the language uh, of, the, of the kind of materiality of the building. I, uh, I think we are confronting uh, a kind of uh, crisis of materiality now because of the uh, ability to, in effect, replicate and represent real stuff with uh, kind of uh, vacuum formed uh, plastic and super glue. And the, the, the juxtaposition of this kind of care and materiality with the, what the public is perfectly willing to accept as, uh, as uh, appropriate and basically uh, commodity efficient is one of the major issues that we all have to face as architects. Uh, I'm going to flip to Le Corbusier because, uh, because uh, I, I think it's very hard to talk about kind of the 20th century history uh, without talking about Corbu. But uh, one of the issues you all have to face with uh, the nature of your elevational development is how you decide on the, the kind of nature. This is the Ozenfant studio, and Korb uh, uh, had this kind of almost mystical uh, appreciation for uh, proportion and reference in his uh, elevational treatment. And if I can read the uh, quote, the uh, regulating lines are an inevitable element of architecture. The necessity for order, the regulating line, is a guarantee against wilderness. It, it's not a, an absolute uh, condition, but it does, let me, let me, I'm losing the rest of the quote here. What if I can get it to come down? Maybe not. Can I get it to come down? No. Sorry. The regulating line is a means to an end. It's not a recipe. It's choice. And the mon mon modalities, modal modalities of expression given to it are an integral part of architectural creation. Okay, uh, you saw the Unite project. Uh, one of the interesting components of uh, this kind of development of modern architecture was a, a, a kind of commitment to a kind of urban design component to every project. So every project at a certain point also became con connected 
to an idea about urban development. And I don't know whether you guys, I, I couldn't find the drawing I wanted to show, but a kind of drawing of Corp showing like 20 unités uh, lined up in the park as, a, as an idea about a new fabric, urban fabric, based on a different scale. And these are kind of like a, a cruise ships in a new urban landscape. Uh, second idea was this idea about the kind of insertion element, which was a reoccurring idea that Le Corbusier had, uh, going back to uh, kind of immobile villas and other projects that were done in the 20s. Uh, the elevational treatment, uh, our discussion of this had to do with a shift in uh, Le Corbusier's work uh, from a kind of abstraction, the kind of aux uh, stucco facade, to the kind of tactile, concrete, plastic expression uh, of the post-war uh, 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 time. The, uh, this project, which was from like 47, 52, uh, was at a time when there were not many options available to, uh, for construction, and Le Corbusier kind of eagerly grasped the use of, of, of concrete, which uh, always historically held out great potential for the modern movement, but uh, was not actually used very often, in, in fact, because of uh, economic constraints. So uh, uh, when uh, Le Corbusier was forced to, uh, uh, forced to uh, design in exposed concrete, he, he readily accepted that and uh, in, enthusiastically oops, reject. <laughs> OK. Uh, this kind of discussion of primary, I don't know. I hope I'm not losing everything. Well, we lost. Uh, I have to ask you to imagine this is the Heidi Weber pavilion. Doesn't quite come off. Let's go on. Okay. Uh, kind of one of the issues that is is uh, in our face today is the relationship between new technologies and their potential and and kind of architectural uh, expression and the uh, and the appropriateness of, of, of that expression. The, uh, this particular example, the, uh, I guess it was called a water cube, which is a, 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 a collaborative venture with PTW and Herzog de Mirian, uh, obviously is not a building which could have been produced 20 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe not even five years ago. And, uh, and what the application of this, this particular technology and strategy is something which needs to be discussed. But at, at its worst, it becomes a kind of uh, excuse for kind of personal uh, uh, choice rather than a, uh, a reflection of the, the range of user, client, uh, uh, community involvement. In this particular case, I think with a special building and a special exposition at a special time, I think it, it, uh, there's a great deal of flexibility in the application of it. Uh, this project, uh, which was particularly interesting for me because of the kind of diagrammatic explanation of the elements that came with it, uh, is a uh, private residence, the, and I'm not sure about this name, Loblolly? Loblolly House. And uh, the, uh, 
when one sees, one sees a, a kind of assemblage of elements that that is uh, almost conventional uh, and familiar at a certain uh, uh, scale and elevation, and much more uh, personal and unique uh, on uh, other sides, but very consistent with a kind of uh, uh, componentized and elemental uh, strategy. This is a, uh, a project I did in San Bernardino about uh, uh, 30 years ago now. It's a 1972 Shane Lane house. It is a concrete house, very much within the kind of modern tradition. Uh, I, I actually worked on this while I was still in school under the kind of extreme pressure of the New York Five. And uh, so uh, the, the kind of uh, Corbusian, post-Corbusian vocabulary was very much uh, part of the priorities of the house. The, uh, the, the materiality of the house came from the client uh, being a concrete contractor and very willing to build in concrete and my own uh, feeling that there was a kind of uh, uh, local integrity to the, uh, 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 the use of concrete in this situation. The house is at the uh, edge of the San Bernardino National Forest. Uh, every 10 years, there's a forest fire kind of crashing through. The idea of having a, a essentially fireproof residential project uh, was also uh, fairly uh, attractive. Uh, the, uh, the contrast I want to make here is between the abstraction of the early international style modernist idea about a new world, a new kind of design, and the reality of building in uh, stucco and what that meant. At the time, this is uh, the Saltzman House, 1967. I was in school and Richard Meyer was coming down to, to criticize the studio uh, on the train. This particular house uh, was built with plywood panels which were taped. So any, uh, and the whole intention was to create this kind of abstract sculptural object, but the reality was there was a disconnect between the, the, uh, the performance of the house and the kind of conceptualization of the house. Now Meyer, and, and this was the slide that was shown, what was the uh, category you, you placed this in? Uh, material indifference or material indifference? Well, I would argue actually that, that Meyer kind of learned his material lesson. He's just not interested in the material. So in that sense, he's indifferent to the material. But the progression of, uh, of, of, of the, the kind of construction process has, has become incredibly sophisticated without Meyer vacillating one iota from the abstraction of the, of the e exterior surface. So if you go, for example, to the Getty pieces that are not subject to the, uh, the travertine curtain wall edict. Uh, Meyer uses this kind of refined uh, metal paneling system. The, the whole system has become very responsive to things like light, control of light, view, uh, uh, control of water, all of these things ha happen in a system. And this was a kind of amusing thing. I've been spending some time up at the, uh, at the research center at the library, and one day 
I'd come out of the Myers taunt skin and find the emperor uh, has no clothes. And the actual uh, hollow Myers skin is, if you just open up the, the uh, doorway, you get to the uh, fire suppressor or whatever it is inside. But that the kind of volumetric mass is just this incredibly kind of hollow skin, which has been refined to the ultimate degree so that every element, the, the paving, the module of the panels, the ceiling, everything lines up. The grid, the, there is a uh, uh, congruence between the abstract center line and the material reality of the building. So it's been reduced to a infinitely thin skin that can uh, basically lay out and conform without any uh, reference to thickness and, uh, uh, and mass. Uh, this was a, a great example that Peter used. Uh, and I, I think for uh, you as architects trying to find reasons to do things, I think to look at a, a project like this, which uses a kind of local material in an incredibly powerful, almost mystical way uh, because of the respect and understanding of the nature of the materials, the space inside, the uh, relationship between the foundation and base, the shingle wall, uh, the, uh, the, the element of structure and enclosure, the way light enters, are all, uh, you guys shouldn't have to look past these kinds of reasons to, to uh, decide what your building is and looks like. You don't have to kind of layer on a kind of marketing uh, story on your building uh, to make it convincing. If you're dealing in kind of fundamental elements and materials in a, a, a rigorous way, you get a tremendously strong uh, solution. Uh, again, uh, skin examples. I can't remember whether this was uh, Gail or, or Kim. You had shown a, 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 a Herzog and Demurion building as well. This is a particularly intriguing use of kind of suspended uh, uh, stone in a kind of matrix of, of steel mesh uh, that is, is both a, a kind of, it's kind of a screen and a, a light controller and a, a very textured, expressive uh, exterior elevation. Here, the, the kind of ultimate thin skin box with glass and translucent, uh, I guess it's a, it's, it's a poly material, uh, it is. Uh, and, and the ability to kind of shape, uh, one of the, the fundamental changes that occurred in, in architecture is a reduction of the uh, of the expressiveness of structure in buildings. So as the buildings have become thinner and more taut, the, in this case, who knows what the structure is in this building? Now maybe at night there actually is some expression of the frame that comes through, but it really is uh, the ultimate uh, container. And again, patterning again with Herzog and Demurian, uh, resulting in a, a kind of new language of form that is both uh, referential, it almost looks kind of like a, a kind of masonry scale, but is obviously uh, something much different, uh, a kind of expression of, uh, of new uh, aesthetics. Uh, this last project I'm going to show is a, uh, a project for... Uh, 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 Sunset Boulevard. It's a multi-use building. I had promised my 
the students, I would show them a, a four to six story uh, multi-use building with kind of retail, commercial, and residential uses. Uh, and I, I'm just going to go through it very quickly. The uh, intention here is not to describe the project in detail, but to talk a little bit about why the building ended up looking the way it does. The, uh, so first of all, we're going to start out with what I would refer to not as diagrams, but a series of presentation drawings that were made uh, as part of schematic design, where I uh, attempted to show the building in its site at the edge of the Hollywood Hills on Sunset Strip with uh, a kind of a very dramatic views out over the city and a kind of hillside development going up and back. The building uh, uh, had a uh, commercial and residential strip building on the street and uh, residential, uh, basically single family houses uh, on two lots at the rear uh, of the property. Uh, the, I want you to keep in mind that there's a kind of repetitive incremental quality to the organization of the plan and the, uh, and the, uh, you can see from the, the plan that there uh, is a kind of articulation of service and structure that pervades the organization of the building. In section, the building uh, has a relationship to the street, which was determined by a subterranean parking, which steps up the site, actually had to overlap because the depth wasn't enough to get uh, regular parking. A, a kind of street slab building with retail on two levels on the street elevation and residential units above which were designed with a skip stop circulation so that the elements could wrap and always have every unit has access to the view uh, the view uh, out in the valley which is basically the money shot for the project uh, where uh, Holland the street comes up the entryway exists as a break between the, uh, the uh, residential and retail elements with kind of sky lobbies on the first, third, fifth floor and a kind of penetration which provides a kind of urban connection up through into the courtyard and then finally up to the residential behind. The this is a kind of uh, elevational drawing which attempts to relate the whole building envelope in a, a kind of rigorous dimensional way. So the, the side conditions at the property line where the four hour wall condition exists, the, the, the street elevation on sunset with a kind of structural frame, which is a kind of double bay, articulated bay, with a slot for the circulation through the building, vertical circulation and circulation back, and a kind of layering, a double scale, and then single floors, one, two, three, four, five, six stories. Study of the elevation in the beginning, we're kind of trying to grapple with uh, structural requirements, requirements of entry, how that could be handled, how do you get the kind of maximum development on the site and break the scale down. This kind of idea about expressing the structure, does the structure uh, come through with a kind of uh, variation in the grid at the entryways? Is there a kind of regularized grid? This has got kind of A, B, C, B, A, whatever. And how do you find a way to rationalize that into some overall compositional idea? You see here where it's starting to evolve into a kind of repetitive 
big bay with a small bay condition and this multi-story uh, double height uh, structure. Now, I, the, everybody in my studio will recognize this kind of drawing where one looks carefully at the section, how that works, and tries to relate that compositionally to what happens with the uh, elevation study models to kind of test that out, uh, perspective views uh, to test it, uh, then the final building uh, developing with a level of materiality expressed, whether it's the concrete block, the tile, which goes over the light gauge steel, lightweight interior framing, uh, and the, uh, the major structure of exposed uh, concrete. The final elevation has punched metal uh, uh, railings, which uh, are both volumetric and transparent to preserve the views, interior views. There are, there's tile, there's uh, uh, a, a, a tile uh, surfacing of the light gauge uh, and there's uh, exposed metal in the balconies, roof, and uh, uh, chimneys. So the, there's the kind of final three-dimensional elevation. You got the, the uh, double structure, the breakdown of structure, uh, the relationship to the street. This was uh, designed at the a kind of bubble point between the creation of, uh, of the new West Hollywood city and its county uh, previous relationship. So the building became a prototype for the new zoning on Sunset Boulevard. The, this is the rear courtyard elevation, the building uh, facing north has a much different uh, elevational treatment than the, the southern exposure. And finally, the last shot shows the elements of uh, a particular materiality with a kind of vocabulary of concrete, tile, metal, punch metal, painted metal uh, uh, that uh, combine for the overall vocabulary of the building. Uh, I want to uh, close with two, two, two final slides. One, a quote from Renzo Piano, which if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read. I, I, I'm kind of constantly irritated by people that re, 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 read their PowerPoint presentation off the, the but I, I want to at least read part of this. An architect must be a craftsman. Of course, any tools will do. These days, tools might include the computer, an experimental model, and mathematics. However, it is still craftsmanship, the work of someone who does not separate the work of the mind from the work of the hand. It involves a circular process that draws you from an idea to a drawing, from a drawing to an experiment, from an experiment to a construction, and from construction back again to the idea. Thank you, guys. When is the lecture supposed to start? 6.30? 6. Six. Jeez. How do we, uh, how do we terminate?